uh, for the last few weeks. I know it's a lot of information. Minister Edmund said something earlier. Information. We've got to get information. We've got to get knowledge. And if we don't know who we are, we're always going to live beneath our privileges. We're always going to live beneath our potential. We're never going to come up to what we... If no one ever told you you're supposed to be an espouse to them, why would you even prepare? If you didn't know you were engaged, why would you preserve yourself and uh, conform yourself to your fiance? And we have to understand who we are. Before I get started, we're going to go into the Word of God. Um, I just pray that the Lord holds me up for the next couple of moments. Y'all thinking he's sick? He can't possibly preach long today. Well, we'll see. Because uh, there's a whole there's a whole bunch of good stuff here. But, but, but you're right. I, I am. I'm already getting sweaty and hot up here. So I don't know if my fever's kicking in or what. But we're going to move on into God's Word. It has a it has a tendency to bless us. But I guarantee you we'll be blessed this morning. Let's go Matthew chapter 7 verse 24. Amen. Before I start, I just want to say a word of prayer. Father, I love you. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Lord, you are our king and our keeper. We pray that you keep sustaining us. Hold us up, Lord God. Father, despite ourselves, let your word come across clear, Lord God. Coherent, Lord God. Let your word bring the truth, Lord God, and power in the hearts of those that are listening this morning. We love you. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 7, 24. Whosoever heareth. We're still on the lesson we've been talking about. The church that will never fall. This is part three of four parts. And the first two parts, we, we, we got into some heavy stuff. We showed you how God has established his, his church. Amen. What brings you into the place of blessing is your praise. David was a praiser. And as he established the Ark of the Covenant on Mount Zion, it was his praise that set him apart. It was his praise that made him fruitful in his life. It's his praise that allowed God to allow him to house this place, this Eden, so to speak. So we're now in part three, and we're going to cover a little bit of different aspect this morning. But Matthew chapter 7, 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. I will liken him, liken you, as unto a wise man that has built his house upon a rock. Matthew 7, 25. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat that house. Somebody say, beat upon that house. And it fell not. For it was founded upon a rock. Very important. This house is founded and established upon a rock. And we've already talked about in the last couple of weeks. The rock is iron. Not the physical location of Zion, but there is a rock that is a spiritual foundation, a spiritual fortitude, a spiritual, a place of solidness in the middle of nothing. But the temple, let's talk about the temple and the cherubims. Eden's garden was a paradisical temple. When we look at the garden of Eden, it was very similar to the temple that we recognize in Solomon's day and the tabernacle we recognize in Moses' day. Amen. <laughs> Mankind was anointed by God to be overseer of all creatures upon the earth, over all creation. After men were expelled from the Garden of Eden, the Bible tells us that he placed two cherubims to stand at the gates or at the entrance of the Garden of Eden. Two cherubims. Then the scripture teaches us when Moses erects his tabernacle, um, we see the same fashion of the Garden of Eden. Both the garden and Moses' tabernacle had only one entrance into it. You could only get into the garden from one, the east side. You could only get into the temple, the tabernacle, to the Holy of Holies through the east side. So when we look at these two things, um, they both had focal points within themselves. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden. That's what man was able to eat from. That's what man was able to obtain, the tree of life. As long as he could get to the tree of life, he would live forever. It was eternal life. After he sinned, man's been cast out of this place of eternal life. But the focal point of the garden is the tree of life. In the tabernacle, the focal point is the holy of holies. If men can get into the holy of holies, even though it's once a year, if men can get to the holy of holies and present his sacrifice to God, there would ultimately be the opportunity for eternal life 
in the Holy of Holies. Israel, all of Israel would be saved as long as the high priest's sacrifice was accepted. There would be a chance of eternal life. So there is a very similar um, thing going on here between these two. <coughs> Solomon's temple also laid out is, 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 is laid out in the same fashion as the Garden of Eden. In the temple there were cherubims that the scripture talks about that were throughout this entire structure of the temple. And the cherubims are, that are always seen as a focal point, always seen as a point of where man first came from. When man was expo kicked out of the garden and cherubims were placed there, throughout the rest of history, whenever you see cherubims, you're seeing a blocking. Cherubims are going to rec recognize or help us to recognize that we are being blocked from God. Even in the temple, there were cherubims at the top of the curtains. And whenever they went into the temple, the priests would go into the temple and see the cherubims at the top of the curtains. They, were, they would recognize there is no way for man to come up this high, come higher into the presence of God. Because sin keeps him in his place. God could come down and meet man at the mercy seat. But man could never go above the cherubims. Their cherubims were always there to block those that fell into sin. And only on, on certain occasions would God meet man through those cherubims. So as we see and we begin to, as we look and picture cherubims throughout history, we, we, under, we have to understand that. So the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, God gave dominion over all the fowl of the air, the beasts of the field, the fish of the sea. And on the faces of some cherub, of cherubim that we see in the Old Testament, we see um, angels with certain animal-like features upon them. Re representing that man had dominion before he fell over all of these creatures. But now that he's fallen, man's dominion has, has, has ceased over them. So, <clears throat> it was in the Garden of Eden that we, that God desired um, that men should dwell in. God wanted man to dwell in the Garden of Eden for all his days. In a per perfect place of comfort, in a place of peace, in a place of fellowship. In a perfect place. And, and returning to the Garden of Eden indicates that men would ultimately come back into the will of God. If, as we talk about getting back into this place, God ultimately it, it wants man to, to, to come back into his will, so to speak. Um, the eternal plan of God is that all humanity would be united to him as his bride. That's his ultimate plan, and that's what he intended to do. And God made man in his image. He made him bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. But now I want to take a moment for you to hear something and think about something. Since God had no flesh and God had no bone, how would man become part of God's bone and flesh? And this is, this is something that, this is very important for us to understand. But um, God intended to marry man. How could he marry man if he didn't have flesh and bone? So of course we understand that God gave himself um, on a preordained, a foreordained time um, that he would set for himself flesh and bone. And that flesh and that bone um, would come into the earth, and we read it last week, this day have I begotten my son. This day, a particular day. A lot, we've often gotten into the discussion about the eternal son. Is there an eternal son that has always sat in heaven? And there's a lot of debate on this question all around the world. But I don't see an eternal son in heaven. That's not to say I don't see Christ in heaven, the plan of God. The plan to save and marry man and to attach God's help to man. I've always seen his word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word of God. The word was God and the word was with God. But we don't see in the beginning was the son. Because if we see the son in heaven, then you have to come up with the mother. Who's the mother of the son? And the scripture teaches us very clearly. We'll talk about that for a second. I don't want to get too off track on this. But when you're talking about an eternal son, um, you can't necessarily do so. The flesh came and lived for 33 years. Christ came, died, was buried, was resurrected. And once he finished that work, he's eternal in the sense that his work was finished. His flesh was broken, offered unto God for you and I, so that now he can marry us. Legitimately marry us. See, God is a spirit. Okay. And I don't want to, I'm getting ahead of myself again. But I don't want to, I don't want to go too fast. <clears throat> but as Adam laid down his life, um, and he allowed God to remove 
a rib from his side, the scripture says, to form his woman or to form his mate. Jesus did the exact same thing. Jesus laid down his life. But out of the side of Jesus didn't come another rib. The Bible says that they pierced him in his side and what came flowing? Blood and water. Very significant when it comes talking about who Christ's bride would be. Except you be born of the water and of the spirit. What I am giving you today on this cross is enough to form my bride. The blood of Jesus Christ. What I'm giving, what I'm presenting into the earth, what I'm dripping and pouring into planet earth, what man is receiving on this day is enough to form my bride. This is significant like no one in history has really ever understood. That's why I'm in love with the church. That's why when I want to stay away from the church because there's so many knuckleheads in the church, I can't. Because I'm in love with the church. I'm in love with serving the church. I'm in love with, with fellowshipping with the church. I'm in love with the church. Because I'm sorry, I'm, as I get older, I'm recognizing how much he loved the church. Before Adam even fell, he understood what his ultimate plan would be. And saints, you and I are a part of that plan. We are the church victorious. The bride of Christ. The bride, well, I'm, there I go again, getting ahead of myself. Let me slow down. But Christ laid down his life and, and, and gave of himself blood and water. Let's talk about the New Jerusalem really quickly. Uh, the church today <coughs> is equivalent in a greater capacity though. I don't want to compare them apples for apples. They're, they're, they're different in their structure. But when you talk about the church today, it is equivalent to the temple that we've seen in the Old Testament. When you see the temple... You, you, can, you, can see, you can clearly see the church. When you see the temple, you can also clearly see the Garden of Eden. They're the same thing. These are entities, these are structures that God chose to come down and dwell with man. Fellowship with man. To have relationship with man. His greatest creation. In the temple it starts, in the, in the, in the Garden of Eden it starts, man's kicked out. He tempts it again with the temple and the tabernacles. He comes down to dwell. It doesn't last. Now the third time is a charm. Because when it comes to the church, he dwells with us. But where does he dwell with us? He lives in here. What, the work that he's doing in here, it's not, it's not, it's, it, it may not be the Garden of Eden. Somebody said, I wish I could be in the Garden of Eden today. Amen. But it may not seem like the Garden of Eden, but the relationship that God has forging in here in your heart with you is beautiful if you would see it accept it walk in it it's a beautiful relationship and 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 the more you nurture that and you appreciate what he is doing the garden of eden is inside you the presence of god the holy of holies is now inside you if i stop right there and i'm tempted to if i stop right there sean i know i bless somebody right there the Garden of Eden. Everyone's trying to get to the Garden of Eden, but the Garden of Eden is right here. Everybody wants the Ark of the Covenant to make the third temple and all this hoopla going on. The Holy of Holies is right here. But we don't understand it. We don't, at least we may think we may understand it, but we don't live according to it. If you understood that the presence of God is here with you, you would talk to him the first thing you do when you get up. Halfway through the trip, getting out the house to go to work, you'd be talking to him. As you're driving to work, you'd be talking to him. As you're going to lunch, in between jobs, whatever you do, you'd be talking to him because he dwells with you. And the blessings of the church, the blessings of the garden, the blessings of the temple are always with us. There's no reason why we should fall into depression. There's no reason why we should be falling into anger and, and wrath and all these different things that we never saw in the garden. Things that absolutely filth that absolutely would never have been allowed in the temple. We seem to be fostering all these emotions every day. But God is right here. Amen. And we've got to understand that the Garden of Eden was the capital of the world in its time. Amen. Now we see that the same thing as Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital that God has placed his name in um, at this point in time. But now God is placing his name in his church. And this is significant. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But with this in mind, let's consider um, that God has given his name to the church. Okay. He called us by his name and he's given his, his name to us. Amen. 
just like he did at Jerusalem. Jerusalem was referred to as a woman in the mind of God in the Old Testament times. And notice that throughout all of man's searching, just kind of think of it this way, God searched far and wide for a nation, a place that he could place his name, and he found a spot, thanks to David, but he found a spot in Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to place my name here. Let's read that. 1 Kings chapter 11 and 36 says this, And unto his son I will give one tribe, that David my servant may have the light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen to what? Put my name. Jerusalem. God, the Lord put his name in Jerusalem. Let's read 2 Chronicles 6 and 5. Since the day I brought forth my people out of the land of Egypt, I chose no city among all the tribes of Israel to build a house in that my name might be there. Neither chose I any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Okay? 2 Chronicles 6 and 6. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Israel. This is significant. This is wonderful. David is a type of Christ. David shows you the kingship of Christ. Um, he encapsulates the kingship of Christ. Of course, Christ's kingship is much vast, much more vast and mighty than David. But when you look at all rulers of all empires and dynasties throughout the world, David served 40 years as king, and he served over probably one of the most powerful governments the world has ever known. And, and the way we equate power powerful government is that there was peace in David's day for a 40 year period and and to have there have been a lot of great rulers that have ruled in different countries but they've never had peace like David did God honored him God blessed him to be that his son ultimately would reign 40 years in 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 a place of, of peace so God honored him and blessed him for that but God chose uh, Jerusalem to place his name there and he chose David um, to be over it so Jerusalem later became known also as the mother of God's people. This is where I wanted to, to kind of talk, just get off track a little bit and talk to you about um, co-matrix or, or who would be the mother of, 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 of the son if we even went down that road. In scripture, all we ever see a, a God calling a mother, if he ever espoused himself or engaged himself with anything, it was two things. It would be Israel. He espoused himself to Israel in the Old Testament. We'll read that in just a minute. And he's also espoused himself through the Son to the church. So Israel is referred to as the mother of God. You don't need to worry what's going on up above the clouds in the throne room of God. It doesn't matter who the mother is. In my opinion, there is no mother up there. But God finds a mother in the nation. And through the nation, he, he births a son. Jesus is from the nation of Jerusalem, Israel. He's from the tribe of Judah. He comes through the line of Mary and, and Joseph. And God birthed at that point in that time through that nation who he espoused himself to, a son. Okay? So when we see, when we see this day have I begotten a son, we recognize that he gave himself flesh to dwell in so that he could move to the next level. I'll put it that way. The next level. This is high technology, saints. When you're talking about advancing in, 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 in um, man, so many terms are slipping my mind this morning. Pray for me. Uh, you're talking about increasing exponentially, increasing in your technology. Um, um, this, the church, the church is a structure like nothing else. I went to the air show yesterday and I got a chance to watch the F-35. They introduced the plane as <coughs> the newest of the new and the baddest of the bad. And I like the introduction. It was sharp. Because honestly, in all, in all honesty, I don't think there will be a plane more sophisticated and high, with higher technology than the F-35. Because in my opinion, y'all know how I think. I don't think we're going to go to much more than 10, 20 more years to go. This thing is wrapping up. So the teeth of the Antichrist, the wings of the Antichrist, will end up being the F-35. There is no plane that really matches it anywhere in the world. Terrence? I can't think of one plane anywhere in the world that would match this, this, this plane. And there have been so many predecessors of wonderful planes in the, in the past, but this plane is designed to do some things that others just couldn't do. So there are other planes that actually have, are more maneuverable and have other abilities, but why do you even need those kinds of abilities if, you can't, if they can't even see you? This thing is invisible to radar. So anyway... When you're talking about increase in technology, the church is an entirely different mechanism. 
it's, it exists on its own plane. It's, it's fantastic um, what God has done in the church. So Jerusalem also becomes known as the mother of God's people. And this aspect of motherhood is enduring um, through all of eternity. And it's hinted at here. Let's read Isaiah chapter 66, 5 and 11 as we reference Jerusalem. Hear the word of the Lord that ye tremble at his word. Your brethren that hated you, that cast you out for my name's sake said, let the Lord be glorified. But he that appears to your joy, he that appear to your joy, and shall, and they shall be ashamed. A voice of noise from the city, a voice from the temple, a voice of the Lord that re rendereth recompense to his enemies. Before she travailed, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. He who hear, he who heard such. Who hath heard such a thing? Who hath seen such things? Shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall the nation be born at once? Or as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring, shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth? Said, said the Lord. Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? saith thy God, rejoice ye with Jerusalem, and be glad with her, all ye that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all ye that mourn for her. And ye may suck and be satisfied from the breasts of her consolations, that ye may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. So this is talking about the motherhood of Israel. We talked about Eve from the time that she fell and she was upset that the serpent tricked her. But the Lord told her, your seed will bruise his head. And he shall bruise the heel of your seed. But your seed will bruise his head. And she's been looking for that, that seed to come and get vengeance on Satan. All throughout history, we've had this, we've been looking for this seed to come back. And here we are, God is saying, be happy. Because Israel is about to birth. My, my, my son, my child. Galatians chapter 4, 26. But Jerusalem, which, is above, which above is free, which is the mother of us all. Jerusalem, which, above, which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. The name of Jerusalem was originally Jebusi. We talked about that last week. And it actually is interpreted as trodden. To be trodden down, stepped on, walked around, walked on. It was always going to be a holy place, deacon. God knew that in his foreknowledge. It would always be a holy place. But it was trodden upon, and even when David found it, the Jebusites had it, and it was trodden upon by heathens doing other kinds of worship in this place. Even after it was founded by David, in times past, it was recaptured by other foreign nations and other religions. There's actually on top of the Temple Mount, there's a, t there's a mosque that stands right now. And it sits up there. So the name trodden is appropriate. Because God wanted everyone to understand, this, this city of mine has been trodden. But God changes the name of the city from Jebusi to Jerusalem. Joshua chapter, 20, chapter 18 verse 28. And Zelah, Aleph, and Jebusi, which is Jerusalem. 1 Corinthians, or Chronicles 11.5. And the inhabitants of Jebusi said to David, Thou shalt not come hither. Nevertheless, David took the castle of Zion, which is the city of David. Give me a minute. Ooh. God took himself a city, and he changes the name of that city, and gave it his name. Just like a man would marry a woman, and she takes upon his name. And I know that doesn't happen all the time these days. Women don't take the names of the men anymore. Uh, sometimes they don't. Uh, but things are changing. But in times past, whenever you're a spouse, whenever you're married, you take the name of your husband. And that's what happens here. God took a city for himself, and he names it after himself. So Jebusi becomes Jerusalem. It becomes a city of peace. I heard a, one, I heard a, a speaker say one time that if you actually go over Jerusalem and you look at the mountain, um, there's a Hebrew letter of the hills make up the shape of a Hebrew letter that actually is the name. Um, it's a name. I, I can't tell you what name it is. 
but it's a name that re is recognized as God. So, um, I probably shouldn't have said that because I don't have any more information to give you other than that. But when God says he put his name there, um, he put it there. Believe me, he put it there in more ways than one. Corinthians chapter 11 and 2. I appreciate you all bearing with me this morning. <clears throat> you bearing with me, T? <clears throat> okay, so the church, the church is the bride of Christ. Just like we would espouse a wife unto ourselves, God has espoused the church unto himself. 2 Corinthians 11 and 2. For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused unto you one husband, that I may be present, that I may present you as a chaste virgin. Okay? God, the Bible tells us, and I think we read it last week, that he divorced himself from Israel. You all remember that? Because she went hard at whoring off and she didn't love him. And the Bible tells us that he divorced himself from her. Those are strong words because the Bible says God hates divorce. But God divorced himself from Israel. He made a lot of promises to Israel. He loves her. But he divorced himself from her. The reason that relationship could not happen is because they were not equally yoked. The nation of Israel and the Spirit of God were not equally yoked. There's no common ground in that relationship. Whenever you become unequally yoked with somebody, the Bible gives us a strong warning about that. You can't be a spiritual person and marry somebody who's not a spiritual person and expect it to work. It, it just won't work. God understood that and he gave her a divorce. And he divorced himself from her. Does he still love her? Yes. Did he still make promises to her? Yes. He's still going to fulfill a lot through her. He did so. But you have to understand, this relationship could not continue. However, this next relationship, this higher technology of the church, marrying the church is going to work. Why? Because they're equally yoked. You're much more equally yoked. God's much more equally yoked with the church through Jesus Christ than he ever was out in the Old Testament temple and the Israel, people of Israel. He called them stiff necks, stubborn. He called them so many names. If, you, if I called my wife half the names he called them, I wouldn't have a marriage. But the truth is, they were, out, they were two different classes. God Almighty, gracious God of all, sloppy Israel. And, and God even told Hosea, I think it's Gomer, he tried to show the relationship. She left him and cheated on him over and over and over, and he still tried to deal with her, but she didn't want to be in the relationship. So God gives us this clear example. But now what we have here is, is, is God making for himself a chaste virgin to Christ, He's putting all of his attention into preserving something, espousing to one husband. The church only loves him. Israel has loved other gods. The church doesn't. The, you, you're not even a part of the church if you have any other God in your heart or your mind. The church belongs to Christ. It's only because of Christ we have come into the church. We come from the water and we come from the blood. Okay, we have been brought into him, ad adopted and brought into this place through Christ Jesus. And we have love, we love him and have all affection for him. So, <clears throat> we've got to remain in the temple. Um, just as Adam should have remained in the garden. You've got to remain in the church just the way Adam should have. But the reason Adam didn't remain in the garden is because he got outside of the grace of God. And the grace of God is the instructions of God. If you're going to continue to live at this level of peace and love, you've got to obey his plans. These are the instructions to stay safe. Adam and Eve couldn't do it. They disobeyed him. They fell out of that place. No difference today. God tells us how to stay in his grace. And, and we have to do that through obeying his word, being obedient to his word. So we've got to, we've got to stay in the temple and truly learn to live by grace, church every single day. We've got to learn about grace. We've got to grow in grace. 2 Peter 3.18, write it down. I don't think I put this in your outline. But you've got to grow in grace every single day. Grow in grace. Removed from the rock, we'll finish, this, we'll finish everything up right here. But to be removed from the rock, a believer who doesn't completely understand <coughs> what it means <coughs> completely understand what it means to rely upon the grace of God 
is not going to make it through his trials. He's not going to make it through his troubles. He's not going to make it through his, 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 his life if he doesn't understand what it means to be under the grace of God, to live in the grace of God. Um, you're not fully founded. You're not fully um, built on the rock if you don't trust in the foundation that you're built upon. If you're still questioning him and doing it your own way, you're not on the rock. You may be standing next to the rock, but you're not on the rock. You've got to be confident that what you're standing on is the only thing that's going to keep you alive. And when people really understand that, see, that's, that's the problem. A lot of people, even in the church today, figure as long as I've got a good insurance plan and as long as I've got a good IRA, as long as my house is paid for, I'm going to be all right. And they're standing next to the rock, but they're not understanding. You've got to know you're going to be all right because what you're standing on says you're going to be all right. It's His grace that got you here. It's His grace that will keep you. It's His grace when everything fails around you that is going to sustain you. That's what it means to live by faith. So, um, <coughs> Colossians teaches us what it means to be grounded and settled in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, 6-15. through 15. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith. As ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through, vain, through philosophy and vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. Who is him? Christ Jesus. The fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, okay, wherewith also ye are risen with him through the faith in the operation of God. I want to come back to that in a minute. Who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead to your sin in your sins, and the uncircumcision of, the, of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting or, of ordinances that is against us, which, he, which, is, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. All the benefits that we just read, we just read above, of being in Christ, are right here listed in Colossians. There's so many benefits. Go back and read this. These are all the benefits of what it is to be standing up on that rock, and you've got to know them. You've got to be able to recognize them. But to remain in Christ alone is not to resort in human philosophy. To remain in Christ alone is not to resort on the traditions of men. Just because grandma and grandpa did it and believed it, you can't stay there. Because you're a different generation and a different time. I know the Bible says he's forever. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. But trust me, he's got different work for you to do than he had for granddad to do. My granddad lived in an entirely different climate, political climate. He lived in entirely two generations ago from me. His heyday was. And, and what he had to go through and what he had to do is much different than some of the things we have to go through. Our children are smoking in elementary school. I mean, there are kids getting pregnant at ages that are unseemly. We're living in a culture that's so much different than what our forefathers had to live through. So the work that God has to do in us is going to be different. Because you're different and your generation is different. So, um... <coughs> We have, to, we have to be able to, to stand on him and not the traditions of men, not human philosophy, but stand upon his grace and his grace alone. And the believers who are able to cry out, nothing is going to be able to save my soul. Nothing is going to be able to uh, pick me up. Nothing is going to be able to save me because no one outside of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice alone has redeemed me. 
Only those people that are, able, ever, that are able to say that are the ones that are going to be saved. Because they're recognizing the grace of God through Christ Jesus. Not, not yourself. There's nothing you can do to save yourself. Now, I'm not saying you... you I'm, not, I'm not one of those preachers that, 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 that points his finger at works. There's nothing wrong with works if those works are done in Christ. If I'm doing works, I give all the glory to him. The Bible says faith without works is what? Is dead. So let's not get mad at works. Works are important. And actually, God is looking for works. What happened to the, to the guy that, that God gave talents to when he came back? He hit him. He took him from him and cast him out where there's gnashing of teeth. Because he didn't work. So we have to uh, be able to appreciate there's work to be done. But that work that you're doing is not enough to save your soul. That's all we're saying. Okay. So don't get lazy on us. Uh, we've got to work, but none of the work that we're doing is able to do the work that he did for us. He died for me, and it's his sacrifice alone. And because we're able to say that, we're able to stand up on that rock, because of this, um, um, people are going to be able to stand when they're able to recognize it's nothing but the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm able to stand here today free from sin, not under bondage of sin. Only the work of Jesus Christ in my life. John chapter 6, 28 says this, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him who hath sent. Who he hath sent. This is the work of God. So the work of the Lord is to believe on God. For his people to believe on him. When I say believe, I'm not just saying believe it. The devil no believes. The devil knows some things, but it doesn't mean he's, he believes or he's, he's obedient to the word of God. Believing is, is not enough. You got to obey it. And if you obey it, you believe it. Okay? You can hear something and not do it. So we have to believe the word of God. <coughs> notice how, notice how um, Colossians talks about that grace. Colossians 1 and 1. Strengthened with all might according to his gracious power unto all patience and long suffering <coughs> Suffering with joyfulness This is grace Grace is divine empowerment right here where it says according to all gracious power That is grace God's power and to live to live in this manner Is to be grounded in grace to live in the fact that God is able to do everything we need done and it doesn't take anything of our, nothing else from us um, gives us that grace. So look how we're made here. It talks about being fit together, heirs of this inheritance. Listen to Colossians uh, 1.12. Give thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet. And that word meet can even also be fit. To meet something together, to fit together. God has actually made you compatible. He's brought you up to fit in to his plan. Um, the Father has given, uh, has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay, we read that God made us fit, or He made us meet, so to be able to be partakers. Um, and God alone can do that. Only God can make you fit. Only God can make you meet. I don't mean meet as in carne asada. Only God can make you meet. Meet the qualifications. Size, make, make you ready to go. Boot camp. Uh, the U.S. military will make you meet. Will make you qualifying ready to become a part of the United States military. And if in that two week, it's a two week period boot camp. Thirteen weeks. Okay. Ooh, I got some laughs on that one. It takes them thirteen weeks to make you meet. Okay, make you fit, make you ready to become a soldier. 13 weeks, and everybody don't make it. Everybody doesn't make it. Right here, we just read that, 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 that giving thanks unto the Father that has made us meet to be partakers of this inheritance in the saints in light. I don't know how long it takes us takes him to make us meet, but he does the work, saints. He makes us meet. He makes us fit. He makes us ready. So stop crying. Stop fighting against him. It hurts. Boot camp hurt. A whole lot of things hurt. But you know what? 
It's all for the good. God's getting you ready to become his bride. He's getting us ready to become his wonderful church. Colossians chapter uh, 1 to 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Delivered us from darkness and has now translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I love it. He delivered us into the kingdom. He did it. I didn't do it. The scripture says he did it. 1 Peter 2, 3 and 7. If so be ye, uh, be ye have te if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto the living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices according to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believeth he is precious, but unto them which is disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or the builders rejected, the same stone has made the head of the corner. The same stone he's made the head of the corner. So, we who find God to be gracious are those that are built upon a spiritual house. We're built upon a spiritual foundation, like the temple, described spiritually as a chief cornerstone. <coughs> laid in Zion. Ephesians chapter 2, 19, 22. Now therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God. Having been, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together. There we go, that word again. Meet, fitted together. Uh, grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place and God in the spirit you're actually being part of the framework for God's new house the Bible says that the 12 tribes were the pillars the apostles were the pillars um, but the church he's the cornerstone but he's taking each of our lives and he's fitting it into this new structure the new Jerusalem where the Bible says it will be like a bride adorning her husband. He will dwell inside of us on earth. But we are going to be fit together into this new Jerusalem. And it sounds weird, but it's not weird. We're going to, we're one entity. We'll be together. The Bible says it doesn't yet appear the thing. It doesn't even enter into the heart of man what we shall be. We are, we're being built into something fantastic. But we are the house. I don't know what I am. Maybe I'm a knob in the, in the New Jerusalem. A door knob. I don't know. Could be a window seal. It don't matter really. But we're being made and fit to become the most beautiful thing in God's eyes in the entire universe. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt getting us there. But the transformation is fantastic. Beautiful. If you let it happen. It'll happen beautifully. So, <coughs> we are the temple that is built upon the spiritual house Zion. 1 Peter 2 and 10 says this, Which in times past you were not a people, but you are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise this morning. Amen.